I want to welcome all of you today. This um, We're really excited to have you all join us for our faculty mini lecture series. Um, just for those of you popping in, we have students from all four of our MBA programs and some of our MS students and likely even some uh, candidates for those programs. So uh, welcome. Before we get started, I want to share a few guidelines for our Zoom presentation today. Um, first, we have muted all of you coming in. We're going to ask that you stay muted until we get to the Q&A section. And we'll do that at the end. And the way I'd like to do that is if you'll just, when we get to Q&A, and you'll know, um, type your name in to the chat box, and I'll call on you in the order that, you're, that you uh, put your name in and let you ask your own question in case you have some um, clarifying uh, that you would like to do. And then, um, so we're, we're going to get through the presentation first and get to Q&A after. You can leave your camera on or off, whatever you prefer. And without further ado, let, let's get to our esteemed faculty who are joining us. So um, I'll start with our guest uh, faculty here, Shanatu Dutta. He is professor. Um, at the University of Southern California, uh, professor of marketing at the Marshall School of Business at USC. He, uh, and I'm gonna add this, it's not in your bio, is an extremely esteemed alum who got his PhD from the Carlson School of Management, University of Minnesota in 1990. Um, in addition to his duties at the Marshall School, he's also the academic director of the joint USC Shanghai Jiao Tong University Institute of Cultural and Creative Industry. He served as vice dean for graduate programs and research at the University of Southern California Marshall School. He also served as USC representative for the USC president to the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. Dr. Dutta's research focuses on strategic marketing issues specifically how firms can use distribution, strategic partnerships, and value pricing to build competitive advantage. He has worked on marketing strategy questions across industries, including pharmaceutical and healthcare. He's published on these topics in leading marketing, economics, law, and strategy journals. And his research has also been reported in The Economist and The Financial Times. Dr. Dutta received the Lifetime Achievement Award in August 2015 from the American Marketing Association for his contribution to the field of B2B marketing. He has also taught at the University of Chicago, London Business School, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, and Singapore Management University. So welcome, Dr. Dada. Thank you, Robin. And yes, and you may have heard the woohoo, which lets you know that Professor Mark Bergen is also with us today. Professor Bergen is the James D. Watkins Chair in Marketing at the Carlson School. His research focuses on pricing and channels of distribution, where he studied issues such as uh, strategic, such as pricing as a strategic capability, price wars, pricing as truces, pass-through, branded variants, dual distribution, gray markets, co-op advertising, and quick response. Professor Bergen's work has been published in a broad array of scholarly journals and business press, including the Journal of Marketing Research, Journal of Consumer Research, and the Journal of Marketing Marketing Science, Management Science, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the Review of Economics and Statistics, the Journal of Monetary Economics, Harvard Business Review, and the Sloan Management Review. He teaches undergraduates, MBAs, executives, and PhDs in courses on pricing strategy and marketing management, earning him numerous awards for teaching excellence at the Carlson School and recognition as outstanding faculty member. Additionally, he serves as a consultant with companies in the medical, service, food, retail, and industrial markets. Professor Bergen holds a BS and a PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin in, at Madison and the University of Minnesota, respectively. Woohoo! I didn't do that as well as you do, but it was necessary. All right, without further ado, let me turn it over <coughs> to our esteemed faculty. And of course, the timing is right now, if, if it's, there's any background volume, I have somebody blowing leaves right in front of my window. Uh, always what you'd expect in these kinds of settings. Anyways, welcome to the House of Pricing today. Thank you so much for joining us here. Um, 
I, I, and thank you for the wonderful introduction, Robin, uh, in, this, in this setting. Uh, let me give a little context, two things. One is a shout out to James D. Watkins, who is uh, one of our most distinguished donors. And in case everyone's not aware, he's actually one of the people who invented microwave popcorn. So if you're actually popping Act 2 popcorn right now for the talk, that's his creation. And so it's part of our claim for fame is in our Carlson heritage. So a shout out to him and, and his generous donation here. Um, I, to set a little context for today's talk, uh, this conversation is based on research Shantanu and I and some of our co-authors have been doing for a while with companies and business anthropologists to look at how to bring social, uh, social capabilities into organizations. It is the first time we presented it publicly and so we, uh, we are very interested in getting your reactions, suggestions, uh, examples, experiences. <coughs> Don't hesitate to join in uh, throughout the talk, uh, at, at question and answer after the talk with us and our co-authors. We're really excited to have this conversation and to learn with you today. And uh, one more call out uh, is before today's presentation, it wouldn't have been possible without the exceptional content and creative support from our own Menakshi Ramalingam, who really made this all possible here. So whenever you see anything that, you know, is it, that's happening, that's all thanks to her. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, applause and everything should go that way. Woohoo! Thank and you, then, Professor uh, Raghun and Professor Shantanu. Thank you for the opportunity. And then finally, I'd like to welcome Shantanu Dutta into the House of Pricing. Uh, as, as Robin said, he's a Carlson alum, PhD in marketing in 1990. He actually brought me into the field of marketing. So uh, you either have him to thank or to curse, kind of as that goes. Um, he's been a great co-author, a great friend. He's a, a great alumni. We're all so proud of him. So can we give it up for Shantanu Dutta here at the Carlson School? Thank you, Mark. It's an honor to be here today and join, be part of the Carlson family. Today, we're going to talk about pricing during crisis. What do we mean by that? Our goal today is to help companies, help customers, and help companies make pricing decisions that are safe for companies, safe for customers, and safe for society. And for our Metaphor today, we've chosen the N95 mask for pricing. Why N95 mask? Today more than ever, the N95 mask is a powerful symbol of how we can all take actions to make our society safer. And today during these very challenging times, companies are dealing with multiple ways how they can survive, how to make profit, how can they manage costs. And those are all critical things that they should be doing for their survival. However, we submit that during these difficult times, it is just as important to pay attention to the social consequences of your decisions. Why now? Why now is because times are changing. Let's look at the quotes from the British Prime Minister of the Conservative Party from two different eras. Margaret Thatcher, a great friend of our President Reagan, her quote, and you know, there is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. Fast forward today, Boris Johnson, same party, Conservative Party, we are going to do it. We are going to do it together. One thing I think the coronavirus crisis has already proved is that there really is such a thing as society. And, and this can be seen all around the pricing landscape. Companies across industries are facing social realities in their pricing from Disney, to Ticketmaster, to internet providers like Bell Alliant. Customers are angry, uh, they're livid, and these companies are being slammed. Probably the most uh, vivid example of it has been the market for hand sanitizer during the 
during the pandemic. Think about you, the, your favorite gouging, uh, your gouging examples, right? From the titles in, that you see on the left in red, uh, you know, kind of from a small school entrepreneur in grade school to a variety of resellers. You can see this quote of gouge much is kind of coming and approaching a lot of companies in these settings. At the same time, you don't have to price that way. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side that various uh, companies are either uh, giving uh, product donations or discounts. The CEO at Purell clearly made strong statements that this kind of price increases is never their focus. Their focus is on access. And Amazon has made a point to limit pricing in these kinds of settings by bringing these social considerations uh, into, into their, their thought process as they set their prices. So the question would be how to think about bringing society into your pricing decision making. And our suggestion is to think about drawing from medicine. And doctors, nurses, um, medical practitioners bring society in early and often from the Hippocratic Oath to being throughout their medical training. Uh, and they, the, the area they use to bring it in is an area called bioethics. So we're going to suggest that you, we think about bringing bioethics into pricing uh, as a way to bring society into pricing. So what, what are the principles of bioethics for those of us that aren't coming from medicine? There are really three central elements. The first is social impact, the idea of doing no harm or doing good. The second is justice. Uh, and for us in the pricing realm, we're going to focus on groups that are vulnerable, groups that are often discriminated against, and these notions of fairness and their importance for, for how we live as society. And then the third is empowerment. And in this case, uh, it would be around transparency, explainability, and dignity uh, around the, the actions you do. Uh, what I would say before we get into the specific pricing examples is none of these are controversial. None of these are new. Essentially, these are eternal principles that people have been using to bring society in for a long time, since Confucian times, when Confucius' rule was, do not do unto others as you would have not, not have them do unto you. Or as we would say uh, in, the, in many Western countries, the golden rule, that we do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Justice has been at the forefront of some of the greatest thinkers throughout time. In more recent times, John Rawls, indicated justice as the first virtue of social institutions. And Amartya Sen, one of the, my favorite economists, has dedicated much of his career to focuses on handling poverty and deprivation of opportunity as being central to how, how, to, how to make markets and, uh, and things work better. And the ideas of empowerment have been around since certainly long before and during the times of Kant. But this kind of Kant quote that people should be treated as ends themselves rather than means to others' ends has been here for a long time. So as we bring it to pricing, it's nothing new. It's just how do we bring it in? So why do we need bioethics and pricing? You've all seen images of governors decrying that they have to go and compete with each other and bid for ventilators eBay style. And you mean doctors saying, saying this is horrible, this is really bad social consequence, this kind of pricing and bidding. What they're saying is what they're bidding for is people's lives. So this image highlights how important it is to think about pricing during bioethic principle during this time. Our framework today is what we call the N95 mask for pricing. We ask three questions which can help you to make pricing safer for your company, safer for your customer, safer for the society. First, can these prices block access to essential needs? What are you selling? What kind of products or services are you selling? Are they essential? Are these products and services essential during these times of crisis? Food, shelter, medicine are essential during these times. Second question, can these prices harm vulnerable groups? 
Who are you selling to? Are you selling to the poor? Are you selling to people who are ill? Does your price discriminate based on race or income? AI and analytics have enabled companies to do a marvelous job on price discrimination. But if price discrimination reinforces social discrimination, then that has terrible negative social consequence. The third question, can these prices take advantage of customers? So is your pricing deceptive? Are you withholding information that can enable customers to make better decisions? Or are you providing information that can empower customers to make better decisions? So let's, let's turn to uh, the first of these three questions. Um, can your prices block essential needs? During prices, crises, identifying what's essential is important. Uh, I actually like that hand sanitizer example, partly because in normal times, it's, not, it's kind of a mundane product. But during a pandemic, it turns out to be a, a, an, an essential element of what's going on and in the lives of your consumers and people. And necessities like food, shelter, and healthcare can become even more essential. What's interesting in that is that uh, a famous economist, Arthur Oaken, once noted that we should treat luxuries and necessities differently, with an eye towards luxuries as being perfect for free markets. But when you got to necessities, there were other social considerations that merited and warranted being thought about as you would bring these things together. Um, and of course, you see it, this kind of blocking essential needs all over, the, all over the map in pandemic times, from face masks to hand sanitizer to even toilet paper. And non-pandemic times, take the poster child for bad pricing practice, Martin Shkreli, and other pharma executives who were even more hated in, in their time because they were pricing in ways that people saw were essential and important in ways that were kind of blocking their access to essential needs. Again, you don't have to price this way. Uh, Amazon has limited prices of hand sanitizer and done well in that response to the market. The CEO of 3M is publicly, again, focused on access rather than price increases in profitability. And even in big pharma, notice the CEO of GSK starts by saying you can start by doing, doing right first and maximizing profit second. Interestingly, that's the same advice Confucius gave way back during his time, during times of crisis, that social justice should take priority over profits in those settings. Um, in terms of thinking about harming vulnerable people, Shantanu was, uh, was, was quite right that you want to think of who you're selling to. And again, think about who's particularly vulnerable. Um, if you think about it, is it uh, low income people are particularly vulnerable to uh, losses of jobs or loss of wages? as you can see in the headlines to the left here. Um, elderly and chronically ill are particularly vulnerable to the medical issues that go on with this pandemic. And it turns out that groups are discriminated against often bear even greater burdens during crises. So that could be, uh, you know, uh, in, in, you can see again in these examples in pandemic and non-pandemic times, the pink tax is, that, is the fact that women's products are more expensive across many markets and, and many product categories. Um, based on gender. And the Geico example is one where Geico used its AI algorithms to actually think about ways to charge more profitable pricing. And that gave, uh, they, that gave uh, working class people higher prices than some of the wealthier people in those settings, which ended up costing them a lot of social outrage and, uh, and also lawsuits. But again, you don't have to price that way. Um, from the, the kinds of wages you see with tech giants that are reducing their, their pay, still paying hourly staff where it's there, to Uber offering millions of free rides to vulnerable healthcare workers and others, to companies from Microsoft to Google thinking about ways to price and subsidize prices for children in poorer countries around internet access and computer access. Um, it's possible to, to price in other ways that take these social ideas into account. So third question is, do these prices take advantage of customers? And as you can see, 
that many hotels are refusing refunds to their customers, even though customers can travel during these times. Homeowners are not getting mortgage relief, even though the government said they should be given such relief. Uber, the example earlier showed Uber doing good. Example here highlights that Uber is using gamification and behavioral nudges to get their drivers to drive longer distances to places that are less profitable for those drivers. Amazon uses his analytics in AI to target, to better understand third party sellers who are doing a blockbuster job in selling their products and then goes and competes with those third party sellers by offering lower prices. So what you find is number of companies are taking advantage of customers by not sharing information or using their power and resources to disadvantage customers. But that, it doesn't have to be so. You can also take actions to empower your customers. For instance, lower rents during this time or Many of insurance companies, what they're doing is reducing the premiums the customers pay because they're not driving these days. This picture of Los Angeles highways is something no one would have imagined they would see ever in their lifetime. Expedia is revealing hidden fees so that customers, that Air, Expedia is revealing hidden fees that Air, airlines charge so that customers can make more informed decisions. So what these examples show that you can do good and you don't any other and you can do harm. So it's your choice of how creative you are in thinking about these things. So when you apply our N5 pricing framework, these three questions are critical. If the answer to all these three questions is no, then you should feel safe that you have taken actions to make your pricing safer for your company, safer for your customers, and safer for your society. So this gives you more confidence that you can focus on prices and not have to worry too much about the negative social consequences of your pricing. If, however, the answer to any of these questions above is yes, what do you do? First, be creative. It's quite possible that there are other ways of pricing that can maintain profitability, but at the same time can have much desirable social, positive desirable social outcomes. So it's, po it's possible perhaps to achieve both these goals. So take time to explore those options. If however, that is not possible, then we suggest be willing to compromise, give up some margin, because by doing that, by giving up some of those margins, you're having a much better positive social outcome. If you can't compromise because you're in tough times, then it's critical that you communicate with all your stakeholders. Tell them what you're doing, tell them why you're doing it, and be very transparent that you have to follow the strategy because it's critical for your business survival. And be honest and transparent, not like the CEO, Martin Shelley, who raised prices 4,000 percentage and said it's because of cost increase. It was all smoke and mirrors. So transparency, Transparency and frequent communication are critical during these times to, for your survival and making, a, making your pricing safe for society. Let's look at each of these examples now. Um, okay, excellent. So Shantanu, I start with creativity. And as you said, always look for ways to maintain profitability and limit those social consequences. Now, Miles talked last week that good strategy was all about, uh, you know, that you can't have everything. So as you'll see next, we'll talk about compromise. But I would urge you in the pricing realm to just step back and see if there aren't different pricing structures that might accomplish those goals more effectively. A couple quick examples that really we found quite compelling. A Norwegian retail chain, many, was faced with 
problems again with hand sanitizer pricing, where if they price too low, people would hoard, but if they price too high, they would limit access. Most retailers have chosen to use restrictions as a way to handle that. So you can buy one, that's it, leading to hassles at the, at the register, hassles with customers. What many did was a completely different approach. First bottle of hand sanitizer, normal price. Second bottle of hand sanitizer and beyond, $100. No more complaints, no more hassles, and everybody could choose what they wanted to do that way. Um, Hyundai has actually been a great example of this since the Great Recession and now during the pandemic in the sense that rather than lowering prices as all automakers did in the Great Recession, they understood that, that the social risk for many of their customers was if they lost their jobs, they couldn't afford the payments. So what they did was they actually gave a, a job protection guarantee that said if you lose your job, you can give the car back. But if you don't, we'll bear the risk. And so again, a very creative pricing strategy that actually maintained their profitability because only 100 cars were ever returned and all of those were resold in a secondary market for not much of a loss and limited the social consequences. All those people buying didn't have to have those concerns about lost jobs and wages and all the kinds of things you could see in those settings. But if there isn't a creative opportunity, then you wanna be willing to compromise. And in this case, what you want to compromise is between um, you getting maybe a, some less profitability, but in return, you get major reductions in social consequences. Similarly, your customers may have to compromise where they would get some costs in social consequences, but in return, there are major returns, gains for your company's survival. One of my favorite companies doing this right now is Uber Eats which is actually growing in sales and it's because of all the delivery and services, but their pricing to the restaurants that they support has been very much aimed at providing free services, uh, payment terms, uh, pricing, discounts, other things to help keep those restaurants whole while they're kind of doing well. And kind of, I'm sure the compromise will go as, as things change the other way. And uh, good news for us as students, as we go forward, even book publishers, are starting to look at ways to compromise in their pricing. And so Wiley Plus is trying to figure out ways that give some profitability there, but also give uh, help reduce social outcomes to important groups such as students. And uh, Uber, which has faced a lot of controversy over the years related to the surge pricing, uh, what they, Uber realized is that surge pricing is critical for the business model because surge pricing is what allows them also to incentivize drivers to drive during those difficult times. So they cannot get rid of surge pricing, but what they did working with regulators and other stakeholders is said, okay, what we would do during this emergency is cap our prices at a level below the three highest price days in the previous two months. And so they compromised and they communicated that with the stakeholders and worked with the stakeholders and communicated with customer groups and drivers. Uber also said they would donate the surge commission they earned during fares, during disasters and emergencies to the American Red Cross. So what you see is this is a very interesting example of a company recognizing that the strategy that they have of surge pricing is critical, but at the same time, they have to execute that in a creative way, which minimizes the negative social consequences. So they limited the surge price level, they communicated with all the stakeholders in a very transparent way, and they gave the money they made during this time to the American Red Cross to balance business profitability with reducing harm to the society. So this gets to our overall framework. So what we have shown is that our strategic use, the N95 pricing framework can have multiple benefits. One, that using these three questions, it helps you to be safe in your pricing and survive better during these difficult times. We think that this framework can also help 
you in the long run in maintaining your reputation and maintain the brand image that you have and help you to be strategically successful. We also think that this framework can be very useful in enabling you to build a stronger strategic pricing capability. Mark and I have worked for several decades with multiple companies with other co-authors and have shown that pricing is a complicated decision because it entails, it impacts multiple stakeholders. In order to change prices, you have to get buy-in from within the company, you have to get buy-in from customers and even the regulators as in the case of Uber. So companies that do a good job of managing and building this pricing capability have a competitive advantage. So that if you take this logic, companies that are good at incorporating the social consequences of pricing as part of their pricing capability would be at a competitive disadvantage because they are less likely to face the heat and the negative consequences that can arise from pricing decisions during these difficult times. Thank you. Shantanu, I would add in kind of, we, we would uh, add our inner ax Zahir, and that it was inimitable. Uh, Absolutely, Mark. Kind of as that would go. I always love to say the word inimitable, uh, you know, to honor ax and everyone in strategy. Yes. But I think you're right, Shantanu, you, you mean we need to go to the last slide. We both want to say thank you so much for taking the time to join us on this, the first presentation of these ideas publicly that we've had. We're keenly excited to get a sense of your reactions, suggestions, examples, experiences, and, and just thank you for sharing some time with us today here in the House of Pricing. All right. Woo! <laughs> and we, we have our first question from Follum and I don't know your, Abby, thank you. Hi, thank you so much. This is so cool uh, to hear. I'm, I come from a healthcare background, um, so it's cool to hear uh, from a, a provider background. So it's cool to hear about pricing, um, especially about of healthcare items. I think, as you mentioned many times, these ideas apply acutely to drugs and to anything healthcare related. So what we're seeing right now is some companies are using things similar to your three concepts. And some companies are absolutely not. People are dying because they can't afford their insulin. So this is all things companies have to choose and they do not have to choose it. How do we as a society get more companies to buy into this? Um, great question. I don't I have, to, I have to see Shantanu's face. I have to put that on. Do you, do you feel like tackling it first, Shantanu, or? No, you go ahead. I'll right, follow. So maybe, let me say, first of all, that again, that's part of what we're trying to hear. And that's what we're seeing too, that it's a choice. I think the first idea is, so Shantan and I, te he teaches pricing out at USC. Most of the pricing uh, capability development at companies is around the economic, financial uh, kinds of elements. So it's around costs and profitability and demand. And, uh, and so one way we think you can do this is to think from their point of view and kind of say, hey, there's a set of capabilities that can be really useful. And we think they're just underdeveloped. They're like weaker muscles. And so for us, the first is just for them to realize, so I guess kind of in our priority order, the first is to realize how important these social considerations are. Uh, the, we like to call them social realities, social consequences. That's been a huge, if I can share a personal anecdote, it's been a huge shift for me. I was trained as an economist here at Minnesota. I taught at the University of Chicago. I taught pricing there. And I, it was all economics. And I used to think, man, this is it. I, I, it's cutting edge, this is the answer. And then I went into the field with our colleagues, Mark Zabracki and Mark Ritson and Shantanu and Daniel Levy. And I watched how firms did this with business anthropologists. And it was clear that there were so many other considerations. And as we took stock over the years, it has coalesced around these ideas of, of social structure, social realities. We're trying to find that right word and that they matter a lot to the success for companies, for customers, for you know, markets, industries, societies. So I guess our first one is trying to get on the soapbox to say these matter. 
once they matter from our side, we've been trying to highlight how important they can be for the success and survival of companies and for groups and then highlight that they can use it. That was our hope here, that these are questions that are easy to ask, easy to answer, easy to apply. And then finally, that they would actually think about building it into their capabilities. So one of the things I do with a lot of companies, I think Shantanu does too, is we try to get to the point of how do you wanna bring these things in? And then how do you build the knowledge, the systems, the processes that allow them to start to take advantage? And, I guess what I'd say, Abby, to this idea is they're much younger on that side of the pricing equation than they are on the economic side. And so it's a long-winded answer for at least how we're trying to bring it in. Shantanu, do you want to say that more eloquently? Yeah, no, I, uh, Abby, that's a great question. And I uh, just a couple of things to build on. I agree completely with what Mark said. I think this is companies are most comfortable focusing on the profitability lens and shareholder perspective, and that's understandable. But as we think more about it, and as times are changing, we have to figure out how do we bring the social impact of our decisions into business decisions in a more integrated way. And that's where that lens on pricing has not been something which senior managers have paid attention to. So to your point, what do we do Perhaps it's, it may be that in that company, they, they have they focused on the traditional metrics of thinking about pricing. So they have not even thought that they, how this assessment of social consequences of pricing or the decisions can be brought in a way which, and in, in, they're thinking that, oh, if you, it's, all, uh, we, it's all or nothing. If you go that route, we can't survive. It may not be the case. There could be creative ways they can manage both as with some of the examples we are giving. So part of it is creating the awareness at the right levels in the organization to help us, help them better understand that no, it's not zero one. It, they don't have to go out of business if they think along those lines, but it could be that long-term it could be better for them in terms of the reputation, in terms of the viability and success as a company. Uh, I would just add, Abby or anyone else in the group, do you have ideas on how to, how to get, how to bring this to companies, to managers and companies in some of the most effective <laughs> ways? We're, we're keenly, keenly seeking advice and wisdom. I, I wish I did. I, uh, as a, a very young professional with not a lot of experience, have seen nothing that works besides governmental regulation, and not even that has worked, especially in healthcare. Um, another example that I've seen a lot of is private equity buying up anesthesiologists, yes. so that when people need emergency surgery, they get these surprise bills. Yeah. And uh, so that and, and drug pricing are two, two areas where I, I think we could use this. <laughs> yep. I, I no, and, and notice, Abby, those are both places where it's essential needs, often harming vulnerable people. And it, what's happening is being taken advantage of, right? So they're buying it up for surprise bills. So uh, again, one hope I will give Abby is this is what students at Carlson study and learn and bring in. And knowing some of the students I've had the, the, the honor of teaching, I know there's whole cohorts of people that are aware of this, are attentive to it, and kind of bringing that out. Another possibility, just to think of it, a research active university like this is thinking about doing some research on this. So uh, I've actually been exploring working with the Minneapolis Institute of Arts around how to bring these two together, as Shantanu said, because for them, these social elements are quite central. Um, and so it's kind of how do you bring them in a balanced way? But so if you can think of places or examples where maybe that could be studied, uh, we could think of field studies to show what the social and economic effects are, to start to show that the economic effects aren't as bad as they think and the social consequences are much larger. We're happy to go in the field. Uh, we used to study the costs of price adjustment and we went to the field with multiple students at their companies to simply learn what it actually took to do pricing. And then from that, that became the, the defining number now that economists use to understand 
you know, what firms need to do to do pricing. Um, I'd also suggest, I, and I, I apologize, it's kind of where Shantanu and I work and live a lot. I do work with a lot of companies in their pricing, how they set their prices. So the pricing teams, and as Shantanu said, the pricing dashboards and analysis tools. So I think part of it may be we need to build and create some of these to bring in. My son works at Nielsen. He's also a proud Carlson undergrad graduate. And when I showed this to him, he said, how could you build similar dashboards to what Nielsen has on pricing for all of these economic financial elements? And what was interesting is if you go to Mia, they do have dashboards around some of these social elements because it's so central to what they're trying to accomplish. So I'm actually hoping that maybe we can bring some capabilities, tools, systems across in both ways to help both sides, as Shantanu said, be, be better. I think from our side, we think we want to approach it balanced. Because if we come out too far is, you, you know, you have to be all the way to one side and the other side's not relevant, you know, it, we're worried that may be kind of getting in the way. So we're trying to figure out the right balanced way to think about pricing more holistically. But, but we, we're still learning and working on it and, you know, appreciate the, any help and guidance. Other thoughts or examples? And by the way, if you, you know, Abby, what was nice here too was to know more examples of where you're seeing it, because those are all places that we can highlight and bring out. Um, so we're keenly learn, happy to learn what you guys see as, as well as just questions. Oh, another question, great. Sarah. Hi, thank you so much. This was um, an incredible way to start thinking about pricing, especially as Abby was talking about within this um, really important in healthcare space. And I was wondering, how would you go about studying this from a research perspective? Like how have you guys looked at the or measured the kind of social positive consequence that comes with this pricing. Yeah, and again, Shantanu, do you want to jump in first or? Go ahead. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll. I'm happy to. It's, it's we're, we're in my our, our house here on Minnesota turf. Yes. Uh, so we're new to this this way. So a couple of things that we have done in the past um, around this is we do a lot of ethnographic work in the field understanding how managers and companies make decisions, but we can also do that with customers. So I think this lends itself very nicely to that, where you could do a place where you knew there was some pricing a company needed to do. You could have you know, one business unit do it the normal way and another business unit do it with some social capability building. And then you could do some qualitative research around uh, what happened and kind of collect it. Uh, and that's usually a, what I call a discovery methodology, which is trying to identify, wow, there were some big social gains and it, you know, or it was, it was really costly or really scary. Like what was going on at this human level to kind of make that possible? Um, at the next level, I think what you, what the, one of the big things in marketing is kind of these field experiments. And, uh, and we've done some in different cases, uh, and the idea is then what you try to do is you try to incorporate this and then change it and then get some data around it. Um, and I, I'll, I'll share it. We once had a study we'd put together with Target and National Cash Register where the idea was they had two stores within a five mile radius and each so the, the customer base was roughly the same. One was going to have electronic shelf labels, one wasn't. And then the one with electronic shelf labels was gonna move its prices more frequently, which is the benefit that had. And we were gonna do some controlled experiments across the two. We had, we had anthropologists dressed as baggers who were gonna interview customers and listen to them in line. So we developed kind of a nice field study to again, simply collect what were the outcomes. Um, those would be at least a couple of directions I would think about in terms of heading to the field this way. Uh, Shantanu? Yeah, and, and uh, that's a great question, uh, Sarah. Uh, there are multiple ways to, that companies are using these days. When you look, look at uh, Uber, what they did was they looked at data, they looked at customer frustration with surge pricing, especially during disasters and like hurricanes and so on. And they realized, and they were getting pushback from, from, from the stakeholders. So they realized that they had to work with these folks to 
Uh, and so, so, so part of it is the kind of responses you're getting either through feedback, online reviews from your customers about are they, do they feel that you're taking advantage of the situation? So the um, volume of this information in terms of their complaining can be an indicator of how serious that problem is that you're facing at this point in time. Uh, and uh, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Google, they do analytics again to track this chatter and get a sense as to what's working, what's not. And then they also do a lot of these field trials in different markets at different times to see responses uh, by customers. So those are some of the ways you can modulate and manage uh, your price changes to take into account these consequences. And, and Shantanu, that's a good fit here given the strength of our information decision sciences group. I mean, it's been one of the top three in, you know, MIS -CIS areas for 40 years. So they've got a lot of data access tools, techniques. So, the, so we're hoping you can bring the social data in more effectively over time and then match that against the more traditional economic financial data that they're more used to using. I see we have another question from Emma Shantanu, which looks like a great question. Emma, do you wanna jump in and say it and say hi to everybody? Sure, I'll pop in. Hi. Hello, hello. Um, thank you guys so much for putting this on. This is really interesting. Um, so I guess my question um, is somewhat related uh, or might be familiar for those of you taking the ethics class. But um, lately I've seen a lot of discussions about, you know, how, to, how is government and industry determining what services are um, necessities or essential? So I guess I'm just curious about how your team looks at this question when doing research. And um, if you have any perspectives on what's happening now as different policies are enacted, allowing like WWE in Florida to be an essential service and all that. Uh so we do actually have a, 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 I think a relatively unique perspective on this that we bring. We actually wrote a paper this summer around using a, a, a very famous linguist named Austin who talked about uh, infelicities in, uh, in, ling in, in linguistic exchange. So I would say our number one defini definition of this is actually to go into people's lives and to try to understand uh, in their lives kind of what are those things that are most essential. And notice we've tried to identify some of those like blocking an essential need, you know, healthcare, you know, income, education, um, vulnerable populations being particularly useful and how you do it in terms of taking advantage. But we tend to, I probably like most marketing marketers who approach this, try to start within the customer's kind of realm um, so that, that's our take on it. That'd be our kind of perspective that we've kind of developed and brought in. Um, in terms of this, what that doesn't do is it doesn't take into account political realities, kind of other elements of who might want to be jumping in and be called essential. Um, but I think ours would be defined very much around some of these very eternal folks. It's hard to think that WWE would be supported as essential by Kant, Confucius, uh, you know, kind of back that way. But, but, but again, it's around, you know, kind of that, that essentialness to survive and essentialness for a group would be where we go. Shantanu, do you? Yeah, Emma, that's, that's, by the way, it's a great question. And, that, and uh, I think you know, our framework can help in helping the debate in some ways. So our hope is that if more companies are attuned to these three questions when they think about their business decisions and other price and pricing decisions, then it can help the conversation because what's happening now is because of this tremendous pandemic, which has caused trillions of dollars, destroyed lives, governments are reacting in a panic and taking actions because they don't want to be seen that they don't care about their constituents. So there is an react overreaction going on and some of it justified. But if the companies get defensive during this time, that isn't going to help the discussion. On the other hand, 
if they take a perspective that say, we understand, we also want to take actions that minimize, reduce the social consequences. And we are doing it by making sure that the kinds of products or services that we have, whether they're essential, whether they're harming vulnerable populations, or to the extent they are, uh, 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 we are not taking advantage, we're giving people the information, we're not hiding things, we're not deceptive. That can help sort of draw a better boundary on quote unquote, what's, what's essential. Uh, you can have the same product, but perhaps you could target lower income uh, folks who are ill and can't afford it. Your AI and analytics should allow a company to micro target those consumers at a much lower price point or even give it free, but to charge this regular price to higher income consumers. So the technology can be a tool also to do good. If you put the lens that, okay, how can I use the resources and technologies and the creativity that I have in my company to offer products and services which minimize this negative social impact. 